If something doesn't feel right, please, 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 all I can beg is that you talk to your doctor. Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new here, my name is Elizabeth and I am a labor and delivery and postpartum nurse and a certified childbirth educator. And today's video is going to be one that has been very, very highly requested and one that is really important for me to try and get out. I'm filming this at the very end of May and it might not come out until June, but May is preeclampsia and help syndrome awareness month. So this video really is to just give you some really basic education on preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, eclampsia, chronic hypertension, all of those crazy hypertension terms that can happen in your pregnancy, as well as HELP syndrome. Give you a little bit of an understanding on what they are, what causes them, what the treatment is, what signs you can watch out for, and what you can do to help reduce your risk of any of these conditions. So we know that hypertensive conditions in pregnancy, particularly preeclampsia, are, are one of the top four killers of people giving birth in the United States. So it's something that we really need to be aware of and really need to make sure that we are being screened for in our prenatal appointments. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing that I want to do is actually go over a lot of these different terms that you hear thrown out almost interchangeably because they are not interchangeable and we don't want to be confusing them. So the first one is preeclampsia. What is preeclampsia? So preeclampsia is new onset hypertension after 20 weeks gestation in your pregnancy where your blood pressure on two separate occasions more than four hours apart is greater than 140 over 90. Now to be diagnosed as preeclampsia, you must also have protein in your urine, also known as proteinuria, or signs of severe preeclampsia, which are showing new onset organ deterioration to the brain, lungs, kidney, and or liver. And we'll go over more of what those signs and symptoms might look like in a little bit. Now with preeclampsia, we see about three to 4% of pregnancies having preeclampsia associated with them. And most of these pregnancies, the preeclampsia starts when baby is close to term or term. So 90% of these cases we see at 34 weeks or greater, but we definitely are going to have more issues and more risks associated when we have preeclampsia that occurs earlier in the pregnancy in that second trimester. So then eclampsia is when preeclampsia develops into having seizures, and this can be due to all of that neurological irritability that occurs with the preeclampsia and that injury to the brain. Stational hypertension, is new onset hypertension. So that same criteria, blood pressure is greater than 140 over 90, more than four hours apart, two separate occasions, but you don't have any of the severe features of new onset organ failure. You don't have proteinuria. Now gestational hypertension will occur in about six to 17% of first time pregnancies and in about two to 4% of multi paris pregnancies or basically not your first time being pregnant, but gestational hypertension can turn into preeclampsia. 10 to 15% of cases of gestational hypertension, it actually develops into preeclampsia. Chronic hypertension is hypertension that actually occurred before the pregnancy. Now, unfortunately, it can sometimes be a little bit more difficult to differentiate because early pregnancy, sometimes your blood pressure tends to run a little bit lower. So you might have what appears to be normal-ish blood pressure that slowly creeps up. But if we see somebody presenting with high blood pressure before 20 weeks, we often suspect chronic hypertension, even if their first few prenatal appointments, their blood pressure was normal. And really how we can differentiate is this gestational hypertension or preeclampsia versus is this chronic is if your hypertension persists greater than 12 weeks postpartum, it is now diagnosed as chronic hypertension. But just to confuse things further, you also can have preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension, which just basically means, yes, you had chronic hypertension, but now you also have preeclampsia because you have proteinuria and or you have the new onset organ injury. So what is the cause of preeclampsia? Great question. We don't know. 
We don't know. We don't know 100%. We know that it's something that occurs when that placenta is forming, something with the vasculature between the placenta and the maternal blood flow. Those with preeclampsia, what we see is very early on with the development of the placenta, the blood flow does not develop as it should. And so these blood vessels that develop are smaller and narrower than normal, and they react differently to hormonal signaling than they should. We believe that it is an autoimmune response, which is why having certain autoimmune disorders actually put you at a greater risk for preeclampsia. And also with each new partner, you have an increased risk of preeclampsia versus having the same partner for the second and third pregnancy. And this is thought because there might be some sort of immune response to the sperm leading to vascular dysfunction. That's kind of what this all revolves around is we have some vascular dysfunction that is evidenced by that higher blood pressure and evidenced then by the organ injury that occurs as well. So what are our risks of preeclampsia? So if it is your first pregnancy, that does put you at a higher risk for preeclampsia, as well as if you've had preeclampsia before in the past or you have a first degree relative, so a mother or a sister with a history of preeclampsia. Having an autoimmune disorder such as lupus, antiphospholipid syndrome can also put you at an increased risk of preeclampsia, as can having diabetes or gestational diabetes in your current pregnancy. Having multiple gestations, so twins, triplets, etc., can put you at a higher risk, as well as doing reproductive technology, and we don't know exactly the reason why behind that. It might be because there's an increased risk of higher order multiples with that, or that it affects how the placenta forms in the very beginning of the pregnancy. Being very young, so less than 20, or of advanced maternal age greater than 35 to 40, the literature shows, as well as obesity can be risk factors for developing preeclampsia in your pregnancy. So signs and symptoms of preeclampsia, and this is why prenatal appointments are so, so, so important and why we do pick up in how often you're seeing your OB or your midwife or your birth provider towards the end of pregnancy. Because for many, many people, preeclampsia, the non-severe version, is relatively symptomless. So to be diagnosed with non-severe preeclampsia, previously known as mild preeclampsia, you have those elevated blood pressures like we talked about and proteinuria which just means that in your urine, there was protein. So this is why typically in the United States at every visit, they are checking your blood pressure and also collecting a urine that they check protein for. Now, you can have preeclampsia without having proteinuria if you have symptoms of organ injury. And any symptoms of organ injury immediately take you from that non-severe to that severe range. Also, having blood pressures in the severe range take you from the non-severe to the severe range. So, severe range blood pressures are two blood pressures that are greater than 160 over 110. And because that is such a high number that can have really dangerous effects on the person with that blood pressure, we don't wait four hours on two separate occasions. We will probably be monitoring your blood pressure every 10 to 15 minutes and then treating the blood pressure appropriately. A really bad persistent headache that doesn't get better with medicine can be a sign of severe preeclampsia. Another sign can be vision changes. So these might be spots in your visions or floaters things are looking different and that is because of that increased pressure in your brain. Right upper quadrant pain can be a sign that your liver is enlarged and having injury there. New onset shortness of breath can be a sign of pulmonary edema or having fluid on your lungs. Another sign can be lab signs. So having your platelets be really low, having your liver enzymes be high, having your creatinine, which is a reflection of kidney function, be elevated can all be signs of severe preeclampsia. And then obviously more severe signs of preeclampsia is the elevation to eclampsia. Other things that you might see but are not necessarily diagnostic for preeclampsia are hyperreflexia or when they check your reflexes, things are really, really exaggerated. You might also have clonus, which is where they push back on your foot and reflexively means you can't control it. Your foot beats back down. Another thing that you might see is excessive weight gain in a week of water weight, particularly really, really heavy swelling that can be found in the face. But these aren't diagnostic. These are just things that we often see with preeclampsia. So 
For baby, what we're gonna see with preeclampsia is that there is a change in the blood flow that the baby is receiving. That really, really high blood pressure can be damaging to the vasculature of the placenta, and it can cause the baby to have a non-reactive stress test or a low biophysical profile, just basically showing us that baby is not super happy in utero anymore. We might also see some, some growth restriction, some decreased growth, some intrauterine growth restriction because the baby is getting less nutrients. This can be picked up by a Doppler study showing less blood flow into the baby through the umbilical cord and we might also see decreased fluid for the baby. So why do we care about preeclampsia? Obviously all of these things don't sound good, right? Like organ injury, baby getting less blood flow, but the big scaries with preeclampsia, there are three and they can affect the birthing person and they can also affect the baby. So the things that we really worry about, right, when your blood pressure is really, really high and your blood is pumping at a really, really high pressure, that puts you at a risk for developing a stroke. So not only are your organs being injured, but you could have a hemorrhagic stroke in your brain that can cause significant injury to your brain. The other thing that we can see, like I've talked about already, is the preeclampsia developing into eclampsia or having a seizure. So with these seizures, we know that that is due to the hyperreactivity that is being caused by the preeclampsia. We also can see multi-system organ failure, right? So if our kidneys are being affected, if our liver is being affected, if our lungs are being affected, pulmonary edema can also be a really, really big scary thing that can happen. And another thing that can happen to baby is a placental abruption where the placenta actually comes away from the wall of the uterus before the baby is born. This is a medical emergency because there is going to be a lot of bleeding and baby's not going to be able to get the nutrients that it needs to survive. So this is why we care about preeclampsia. This is why it's important. It can be potentially devastating to both the person who has experienced preeclampsia and then also to your baby. So treatment. There is no treatment of preeclampsia that will make the preeclampsia better or go away except for delivery of the baby and the placenta. Now timing of that is a little bit tricky. Your provider and you are going to have to discuss pros and cons based on when is your preeclampsia developing. If your term and induction will be recommended for preeclampsia, and that means 37 weeks or greater. But if you are preterm, we're gonna look at the severity. Are we in a non-severe range or are we in a severe range? And that's gonna affect what we do. Now, if you are needing a preterm delivery, more than likely you will be given a dose of steroids to help your baby's lungs mature for proceeding with an induction of labor or a primary cesarean birth depending on how severe your preeclampsia is. Now with those high blood pressures, we really wanna make sure that we treat them so that we do reduce our risk for stroke. Typically in a hospital setting, those will be treated with labetalol or hydralazine given IV to bring those blood pressures down into a safe range. And to decrease your hyperreactivity of your brain, we often give magnesium sulfate through an IV drip for 24 to 48 hours, depending on what's going on. This also can bring down your blood pressure a little bit, but that's really not the main point of the magnesium sulfate. The main point is to raise your seizure threshold. Now, magnesium sulfate is a relaxer of smooth muscle, so it's going to make you feel really hot, really uncomfortable, a little bit woozy. It's, it's pretty miserable. So your nurse is going to be checking on you very, very frequently to make sure that you're feeling okay, make sure that you are continuing to breathe at a normal rate, make sure that all of your reflexes aren't completely going away because you can get too much magnesium, which can cause magnesium toxicity. With the magnesium, the magnesium can kind of slow down the contractions. And so with the induction, we're trying to bring the contractions on. It can be a tricky balance to kind of get those things going together, but it is not impossible with magnesium. Just know that more than likely you will be considered a full risk if you're on magnesium and that it might not be as advised for you to be up and moving. Doesn't mean we're not gonna change positions, but up and moving because of that increased risk of falls as well as the increased risk of our seizures and our strokes with the severe preeclampsia that we're seeing. It used to be recommended that when you developed preeclampsia you went on bed rest but we know that bed rest does not improve blood pressures, it does not improve preeclampsia, but it can increase your risk of developing a deep vein thrombosis. Now what they will recommend is decreased activity. So like 
looking at how you're exercising, not doing strength training, maybe working from home instead of working in the office, things of that nature. Now looking on to postpartum and future pregnancies, what can we expect with preeclampsia? Now for those who develop preeclampsia at term, at the later stages of pregnancy, the chance of reoccurrence is not super high. It's only about 5%. But if you developed preeclampsia, specifically severe preeclampsia, in your second trimester or before 30 weeks, chance of reoccurrence is as high as 70%. So what are some things that we can do to decrease our chance of reoccurrence? Or if you're high risk for developing preeclampsia, things that we can do for that. So your doctor might prescribe a low dose aspirin that you start on, and this low dose aspirin would be started in the second trimester. Semester, so at about 12 weeks, that can reduce our risk of having issues. Now postpartum, just because the baby and the placenta are out, you might still need some extra monitoring and extra medications to control your blood pressure until the preeclampsia completely resolves. And if you have any worsening signs of preeclampsia, you definitely wanna let your doctor know postpartum, but more than likely you will be having early and frequent follow-ups to monitor your blood pressure because, and this is so important, rarely, but it can happen, preeclampsia can develop postpartum. I have a video all about the big scaries that can happen postpartum. I'm going to leave it linked here. This is so, so important that we are aware of the things that can happen when you go home because a lot of us aren't seeing our providers again until six weeks. You can develop preeclampsia from about two days to six weeks postpartum and it's considered postpartum preeclampsia and it can have really devastating effects just like preeclampsia can in the pregnancy period. So really, really monitoring yourself for these signs or symptoms of a really bad headache or vision changes is going to be really important. And then later in life, we know that having preeclampsia puts us at a higher risk for developing cardiovascular issues. So things that we can do to help our cardiovascular health, such as eating healthy and exercising, super important. But then also continuing to do your preventative health care, seeing somebody for your yearly physicals and not just seeing someone when you're pregnant is so, so important to making sure that if high blood pressure or any cardiovascular diseases do develop, that they are treated early and most effectively. Now, the last piece of preeclampsia that I want to talk about, that I want to talk about specifically, is called HELP syndrome. And it's H-E-L-L-P, and it stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Now, HELP is a type of preeclampsia, but it's kind of a weird type because you do not have to have elevated blood pressures to develop HELP syndrome. HELP syndrome often develops very quickly and can be very, very, very devastating because of the risk of abruption and the risk of liver rupture. So the symptoms of HELP syndrome include nausea, vomiting, headache, and then that right upper quadrant pain from your liver. So often with help, what we see first is that people are presenting with really bad right upper quadrant pain, right where that liver is. And the last patient who I saw come in with help syndrome was crying because it was her upper right back was so painful. And as the blood pressure cuff is getting tighter and tighter and tighter on her arm, I am like, oh my goodness, she is in help syndrome. And we got the doctor there stat and we ended up having to do a emergency see cesarean birth for her under general anesthesia because sometimes with those low platelets we cannot safely perform a spinal so we did that and we got her baby out happy and healthy and safe and they both went on to do very very well but this is why if something doesn't feel right please 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 all I can beg is that you talk to your doctor and if they don't take you seriously say hey this is what I'm concerned about can we please double check because that is their job is to make sure that you are happy and healthy and safe. And we don't expect these kind of things to happen to us, but when they do, they can be devastating and catastrophic. That's my spiel on preeclampsia and help syndrome and all of those things. If you've ever experienced preeclampsia, if you have any personal things that you'd like to share, I'd love to chat in the comments as always. And until next time, bye guys.